Hey everyone, I'm Travis Wright, and you're listening to I'm a Fan Of, your show for music, comedy, and more. As always, if you are a musician, a comedian, or just someone that does something interesting, please reach out to me on Instagram at Travis Can Listen. You can find me on Facebook at I'm a Fan Of, or you can reach out to me through the website at I'm a Fan of Pod.com. Of course, if you just enjoy the show, please follow me there as well and like and subscribe to the podcast. This episode, man, I'm so happy to have this guy on the show. We've got a phenomenal musician, artist, singer-songwriter, Matt Tedder from Fort Worth, Texas, and he just released a solo album. His second, his first one was an EP or solo. He, we talk about it in the show, but his latest release is a full-length album called I Can Dream You. Absolutely incredible. It's dedicated to his late father, and we get into that how uh, in, in this episode about how his father uh, showed him a lot of this music and was a little bit of the inspiration behind some of the the style choices of writing. Um, but beyond that, it's just a phenomenal album. Um, it's it's very rare that you get an album that feels as complete as this one. It feels like there's you just wouldn't change a single thing about it. Front to back, every single song is good. I don't find myself skipping anything, and I've given it several listens at this point. Um, man, I just love it. I will say, uh, we talk about it in the episode about how uh, artists need help. If you are a booker, a manager, a label, somebody who can just help with the business ends of things for Matt, he talks about how that would be one of the biggest things to help improve what he's doing right now, that he can focus on the artwork, but having people to help him on the back end would be just a huge help. I do a music review. Please go listen to that. If you don't have time for the full album, I play a couple of my favorite songs and talk about why I like them. Um, but if you enjoy Matt's music and you find yourself a little business savvy and you want to help him out, please reach out to me, reach out to him. I'm sure he would appreciate any help he can get. Uh, but just, a, he seems like a phenomenal guy. I really enjoyed our conversation. I love his music and, uh, I hope you enjoy him as much as I do. So let's go ahead and get into it. This is Matt Tedder. The I'm a fan of podcast, music, comedy, and more. All right. Welcome Matt Tedder. Travis, dude. thank you for having me. Uh, dude, thanks for coming out. I know you drove uh, quite a ways today, so that drive can either be that drive from Fort Worth to Dallas can either be like thirty minutes or it could be an hour and a half. <laughs> today it was thirty. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Um, dude, right off the bat, man, you have created a beautiful record. Thank you. And so it is much, it man. is a um, it it touches me in a soft spot because I love when people make a complete album. You know where there's a theme. All the songs, even though they drift here and there, it's kind of this overarching theme. And your album just feels complete. Does it feel that way to you at all? Oh, yeah. 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 I I definitely wanted to touch a lot of bases on it. Genre mm -hmm. and and song styles and stories and mm -hmm. grooves and all that. Yeah. Dude, well, you hit the nail on the head, man. Thank you, man. It's uh, I was literally, we, we live near White Rock Lake, and mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do a bicycle ride in August, like a really long one. And so I've been going around there training and, uh, I was listening to your record because, you know, you got, I was out there for about two hours and I had to turn the record off record off because I was like, it's so chill and relaxing. Like I'm not able to put the miles in, you know? Up, yeah. 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 And, um, and then I was thinking about that, you know, and how it contrasts with your, your, was that your first record? The other one in 2016? Yeah. I mean, it was two different people. Yeah. Definitely two yeah. different people and, you know, seven songs, more like an EP, whatever that stands yeah. for. And, um, yeah, I mean, this one, though, you know, being 10 songs and printed it to vinyl and everything, mm -hmm. it feels more like an album. Yeah. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, totally two different people. What's it, uh, what's it feel like knowing you've written this album, but when you look back on that album and they're just completely different? Well... There's a couple common threads. Like there's there's one song um on that two thousand sixteen release mm -hmm. called Seventeen O One Blues. Mm -hmm. And that's kinda almost got like a country thing to it that I didn't really keep um I don't know, fanning those flames of that style. Mm -hmm. You mean but back then in twenty sixteen? Back then, yeah. yeah. I kept on after that record, I went on to form kind of a rock and roll project and um, chase the harder sounding music of mm -hmm. rock and roll and everything like that. But I think in that song and then like a song that that record's titled after California Mercy Me, that's kind of got that folksy country vibe about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the others are like 
pretty hard rock oh yeah stuff. they're just rock man it's it's pretty uh drastic contrast mm-hmm. is of each other um but yeah i mean looking back i mean so much has changed uh in life and um but you know i still find myself wanting to listen to rock and roll every now and again just not as much Mm -hmm. you know i mean i generally get in the car and i put on older country music or singer songwriters or um americana stuff anything like that it's just i don't know um it's drawn me closer to it than rock has over the last few years i guess it's something that kind of comes with age a little bit. i don't know <laughs> my dad told me once that he didn't listen to country music until he got divorced <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's funny yeah and uh you know i, I get it it's definitely something i'd heard a lot of the only country music I really dislike, you know, is like pop country. Of course. Right, of course, you know. And and that's what it is. It's it's just pop music, right? right. Which is fine. If you love it, you love it. Yeah. But um the country music you and I are talking about, you know, where there's a little more uh a little more soul behind it, a little more realism maybe. Yeah. Um th- I think that I think you have to have some maturity. You either have to have hard times at a young age or you have to go through something for you to maybe appreciate someone else's hard time. And it, I think until you do that, it's just noise. That is a great point. Yeah. I mean, if you can't really relate to what, you know, uh, Hank Williams or Merle Haggard is saying, you know, it's, yeah, it's probably not going to mm-hmm. strike. But I mean, even sometimes not being able to relate to it, like I've never been to prison. Ed, you know, like, but well, neither, whenever I hear Johnny Cash, though. right, exactly. <laughs> but whenever I hear like Lonesome Fugitive, it's like, man, that is just the coolest song. Like, yeah, you just picture that character. And I don't know, it's it, they're kind of like little movies, you know, I, I there's a, a more clear cut storyline and somewhat easier to follow just narrative of a song. Mm-hmm. And country music is so much about good songwriting matched with beautiful melodies and honestly incredible musicianship yeah like something that that's another thing that i love about an act like the grateful dead Mm -hmm. they would cover country music but take on this it take it on this new life um you know for better for worse for some country fans but (laughs) um but yeah. Um, you know, introducing a younger audience to, you know, Marty Robbins and Merle Haggard and, you know, being like, Hey, this stuff is cool too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I've just learned so much with country music in the last couple of years that, um, I was really hungry for in my time playing rock and roll. Rock and roll is a lot of fun to play too, but something I found in it is sometimes it can be a little restrictive. It doesn't have to be, but the stuff that I was playing felt like it was. In in what way? In that, you know, here's the parts. Mm. We got a chorus or verse, chorus, and the solo section is very mathematically crafted that you have to play these parts because there's another guitar player over there Mm. that we're harmonizing with and we're, you know, we have crafted this thing to be this way for only this long amount of a time. Right. Whereas, like I said, Grateful Dead, you take that form, take your time with it for a little while, you know? Yeah, and it's been really hard for anyone to have that type of form, more free form, rather, yeah. and break into the mainstream, right? Right. Um, I mean, Grateful Dead is probably the biggest example, and then somebody maybe like Frank Zappa, who can get up there and just oh, that's so free will, right, and just yeah. do whatever he wants to. Because most people... I think it's hard for a fan to appreciate how difficult that is to play in the moment. Yeah. You know? And so I think it's harder for them to go like, wow, that was incredible. You know, um, that this is a one-off performance that I get to see right now. Cause I've been guilty of that in the past. I've, I've gone to so many shows where something different will happen, uh, especially when I was younger. And you'd be like, well, that's not like the record. Right. You know? Right. And then as I've gotten older, it's like, no, 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 I can listen to the record anytime. This is the show. Yeah. You know? And, 
I think people have a hard time breaking out of that or just don't know that you're allowed to experience it that way. Right. And I definitely hear where you're coming from. I've had that same feeling watching an act that I love as well. And it's like, oh, they played that a little slow or something <laughs> like that. You know, yeah. um, I've definitely been there. But um, you know who I, broke me out of that the most was uh, Sturgill Simpson because his records are just so different. I don't know how much you've dived in on him, but... A little bit. Yeah, it, it's just, you can pick up... I mean, I guess probably his first two records had some similarities, but mm-hmm. after that, he just... Uh, once he won a... Um, uh, what? Oh my gosh, I'm blanking right now. Grammy. Yeah. Once he won a Grammy for his, I think, third album, he kind of had, you know, like, fuck you experience now. He could just do and play whatever he wanted. And so he's done, like, more kind of country albums and then he bluegrass, did like bluegrass yeah yeah yeah. He, yeah he did the double bluegrass full thing um he's done like rock motown stuff and i mean he's all over he did a full-on rock thing with an anime netflix thing that matched up with all the music perfectly man it's just all over you know and uh, he kind of made me appreciate it. it's like no nah, man it's it's more free than that you don't have to be so you know strict on yourself that is nice um yeah and that's kind of where um I think artists, it makes for just an interesting deep dive, you mm-hmm. know, to, I don't know, you see all these different caricatures, you know, Paul Simon's a really cool one at that too, you know, um, yeah, just, man, everyone likes to put something in a box, but man, <laughs> being in a box is not very comfortable. Yeah. It's pretty claustrophobic and yeah you you want to break out of that thing and i get it marketing something yeah yeah you want it in that box but man to be creative you definitely don't want to be in there i struggle with what you just said a lot about how you um basically how you change the music machine a little bit more back to what it was kind of maybe 60s 70s 80s um even into the 90s it was still really broad Right. There were like you could turn on a radio station and there was a lot happening on one yeah. station. Yeah. And then um, I think a lot about just, you know, it seems like bands, artists, there's almost zero path for you to see like, OK, I can take these steps and become a full time successful musician. Right. That doesn't exist anymore. Not a single rhyme or reason to it. Right. It's all kind of random. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, it's like I miss knowing that like this city had this wild DJ who would just spin and play whatever they wanted. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, no, 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 we're going to play a seven minute song today. Right. You know? Um, and it's like, I think if people could, the people who are in charge of marketing music right now, mm-hmm. I think they're so scared of taking chances because they have to pay bills, but they yeah. forget that that's what music's always been about is, you know, taking a chance on this different record, this different thing, even if it doesn't appear marketable, you never know what's going to strike that chord with people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I can firsthand really relate to what you just said because, you know, um, my publicist has, you know, kind of had a hard time with, like, getting this, my record, because it's got all these different things. It's mm-hmm. not just country, it's not just blues, it's not just rock, it's yeah. just a mix, you know, and, and hmm. publications and, you know... Um, How does your publicist just, try to describe it? Ah oh, man, I I <laughs> I, can't, I I have even trouble r- describing this thing, but yeah. you know, um, it's just um, I don't know. It there's so many different styles of music that I enjoy, and then yeah, I mean, I I hear what you're saying though. Um, well, because music like, marketers need to point at something, right? You know. This is this, and it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that what's crazy about that is, you know, you're talking about the box, right? Like genres. Like yeah. if I go, oh, it's um, it's country with a little bit of folk, but there's some bluesy stuff in it, right? Yeah. It's like everyone's version of those three things that I just said is totally different. Like mm-hmm. what you consider to be blues and folk and country, everybody's kind of got their own, you know, they've made up their mind of what that is, whether they realize it or not. Yeah. So you might go, oh, that's probably not for me. I don't really care for that, you know, mm-hmm. um, because you're just, you know, there's not a great common language anymore to describe people's albums, you know, no. it's, it's almost, and you don't want to sit there and give them, you know, a five minute speech about <laughs> the whole record. And, you know, it's a, it's like, you almost need to get back to the days where it's like, just give it a listen, 
go listen to this for like an hour and just tell me what you think later. And I wish it was that easy. <laughs> you know? I think more people do it than you realize. It's yeah. just uh, it's it's just getting over that initial hurdle. I think vinyl coming back as well as it has changes that because I think when people get to look at your cover and see a picture of you and flip it, you know, flip it over to the back and learn a little more about you and something about having that tangible thing, whether it's a vinyl, a CD, a cassette, whatever people are doing, I think that's humanizing you more than the stream, you know, than just streaming Definitely. something. So I think it's going to come back. It's just going to be slow. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea. I just think like the trick to this thing is just to keep doing it, mm-hmm. you know, um, I have no idea how to market or like I don't promote myself or yeah. whatever, but like I'm um, I'm gonna try to to the best of my ability keep writing songs, yeah. keep on like putting out videos and stuff like that, and and the audience that it's gonna cater to is gonna find it, and mm-hmm. you know because I see so many performers now that I look up to that they have kind of like these cultish audiences mm-hmm. like they're not mainstream household names by any means but they make a pretty good living mm-hmm. and their music isn't like stuff that's you know cut and dry one certain thing mm-hmm. um there is just so many avenues to take with music and um i like artists that stretch those boundaries and just be themselves and once you keep doing it for so long an audience just i think they expect it and they're happy that you're just being yourself and that you take these sharp turns Mm -hmm. or whatever you know they're right there with you um it takes a lot more work but um i think it's more worth it than you know uh whatever alternatives there are that don't even seem as accessible as you know they once were um, I mean, now I hear about uh, labels and everything like that. I mean, that that just seems like such a uh, far off thing. I don't know. I, it, yeah. it might not be. I'm not signed to a label or anything <laughs> like that. I mean, but, maybe. I mean, you know, but I hear stories that like people have meetings and it's just like, oh, what are your social media numbers and Spotify numbers and everything. And it's like, well, aren't you supposed to help with that? Exactly. I, I want to so talk. it's like, I, you know, and by the time you like build it, what do you need them for? I don't know. I, I want to talk know. to several labels. There's yeah. a few that I think do it really well. Um, but I want to talk to a lot of them because I, I feel like many of the labels that are not huge, that are on a smaller level and trying to get going, mid-ranged, you know, established labels, I do think maybe they need to ask themselves more, like, what do you bring to the table? Your goal, like, the the artist's job is to create music that's great and be able to replicate that and play music live, and your job is to now help sell that so they can keep doing their artistic vision, you know? That's well, that's the old agreement. So it's, like you said, it's if I'm coming to you with a following and all this going on, it's like, I kind of don't need you, do I? And that's that's what I see... I feel like there are some people that are kind of realizing that. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I mean, and no one's going to do your social media, I feel like. I mean, yeah, I mean, someone might, I don't know. Well, but people like, know, but people know when the label's doing the social media. Exactly. You know, and nobody really, like, I, I'm following you on social media to learn about you. Exactly. I don't need all the polished p- photos and, and Man, that... written responses. It's like, I'd rather see you like, oh, I'm on the back porch trying to write a song, you know. And, and the more raw it is, I think now things are so polished and so fake that people are appreciating that again. You know, they're starting to go like, oh, he really is just in his house in this area. You yep, know? yep. And that is so true, man. I mean, people, I mean, even though everyone's on social media like no other, mm-hmm. and yeah, sometimes that mass marketing works, but I I do like those videos of the people that I like to listen to and follow, like... It's just raw, like, and that's what's kind of neat about where we are with a lot of independent music is that, man, you can do this yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, just do it every day, you know, but, um, uh, you know, just pulling out a phone. I mean, these things take good video. They, the audio sounds pretty good. Like Mm -hmm. you don't need fancy stuff, 
you know, a lot of the coolest records that have been coming out lately are just so low budget. It's crazy. Yeah. And then they blow up. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's the song, right? It's not the recording. The it's re- the song. It's as the long feeling as it's listenable. It. Yeah. If it's listenable, if you don't cringe because something is just so poorly recorded, your song's going to come through on it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it it is amazing how far we've come with technology. But granted, this record that I made mm-hmm. is not that. <laughs> we you uh, recorded down in Austin, right? I recorded down in Austin yeah. in a very nice studio. Uh, it's called the Finishing School, and it's ran by Gordy Quist mm-hmm. and um, Matt Largent. And uh, yeah, they have just built an incredible studio that's got tons of nice old vintage gear and microphones yeah. and amplifiers and guitars. It is. Did you kind get of to a did you get, land. Did you get to record your vocals on a ribbon microphone? No. Okay. They sound okay. so warm because you're a very uh you know like first of all your vocals are very deceiving in the sense that um you realize when you're listening to them that there's so much subtlety happening cuz on this record in particular you're a very quiet but purposeful singer. You know the way you'll drag out something and you think you're done singing but then there's a little cap right on the end of it. Or uh, j- just those little choices, right? And so I was, I was really wondering. I was like, man, I wonder what kind of mic he's on because it's quiet, but it still sounds very warm, and it sounds very, you know, it doesn't sound like a a uh, cold condenser, right? <laughs> well, I'm not sure which one he used, mm-hmm. but I mean, we shot out a couple microphones, and they were all condensers. I'm pretty sure, okay. maybe maybe a ribbon or two, but we settled on a certain Neumann condenser, and everything goes through a tube preamp in there yeah. and so i mean the signal chain is really simple mm-hmm. and but it's just good they you know, know what they're so doing man it's a great sounding record really do and um did you and, go in there asking them to keep it simple or was that a choice that you guys kind of came to together or i think that was a choice uh gordy who produced it um we kind of came to together mm-hmm. um i mean everything did kind of happen simple and organically just not trying to um change or morph these songs into anything too far from the way that they were brought into the studio Mm -hmm. and that was something that i was so thrilled about the making of this record my vocals in particular is that this was the first time um that vocals just felt like they were so easy. Mm. Um, and honestly, it kind of, um, the reason being is that I wrote songs that I felt fit my voice better. Um, and this genre turned a little bit into a classic y country bluesy thing mm-hmm. that isn't this loud, like trying to sing loud or super projected Mm -hmm. over the top of like a rock track yeah which is what's nice about that though is um there's a lot of nuance in people's voices when they're able to stay in control yeah and when you're not projecting that much it's like i get to hear the unique timbre of your voice right rather than you trying rather than it sounding like oh he's trying to sing like this person right you know and it comes across on the record very well i think man i I'm so happy about that. Um, yeah, I mean, we would we would do like two, maybe three run throughs a song, mm-hmm. and you'd be like, "You got it, dude." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, thank God." Does that almost make you more nervous? Like you're gonna hear it back later and go, "Ah, we should have done something different." <laughs> no, man, <laughs> it's a sigh of relief. That's what's been so nice is that you know I would, I still you know we'll hear the record and just be like, yeah, that sounds like me. And that feels really good. You know, I didn't, you know, put on this character or anything that I wasn't. It's Mm -hmm. just the way that I sing. And there were not really notes. It was just like, Hey, you might've been a little flat there or something like that, you know, just like keeping me in check there. But as far as like delivery and, um, style, there was no like, Hey, you know, mm-hmm. you know, so, uh, yeah, that, that just was such a sigh of relief <laughs> big time because I, yeah. I, I have, you know, recorded before and, and just gotten, you know, I, I'm not like, 
you know, any uh, Freddie Mercury by any means or anything <laughs> like that. I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of places I can go with my voice, but I know which places I can go. Yeah, and that's just where I want to be, and I don't really like want to go places that it doesn't where I don't feel like I belong. You know, your voice though. Uh, my wife and I were having a conversation about singers like you because um, that's the deceiving part is uh, singers like uh, the Nelsons, Willie Nelson, Lucas Nelson, mm-hmm. Roy Orbison, those Ooh. guys. Their vocals sound very, very easy. <laughs> right? Like if you're just listening and singing along in your car, they sound like, oh, yeah. he's he's not doing much, you know? And it's only when you try to sing along with it where you're like, Jesus, there's yeah. so much happening that you're not pay- It's very, it's all subtle. Mm-hmm. But if it was gone, it would be a terrible vocal. And it's stuff that it's it's uh it's it's stuff that gets overlooked. It's not easy to appreciate because again, it's not like, you know, Mariah Carey belting out these notes that are impossible for the average person to hit. It's like right. the average person could find a way to sing like those people I just mentioned. You're just gonna have to really work at it, but you could find it, but it's really hard to get there. You know? Man, I and, don't and, know. And, Roy Orbison's like a feat, <laughs> man. His, his, his sound is so unique. I can't even peg what it is yet. I, but every time I play some of his songs, it's well, just it's it's a strange voice. It should not sound as good as it does. Man, and what was so cool about Roy is that his voice was so good. That was the entire show. <laughs> you watch videos of Roy and all that he is doing is strumming that guitar on stage there. in those shades and yeah. just standing there. Just melting and hearts. And then, you know, <laughs> he'll start way down here crying. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of that thing, he's an opera singer. Yeah. Like, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean... You know but, that song, um, Anything You Want, uh-huh. You Got It. Yeah, that's yeah, one of those yeah. ones that's like that, where you're listening to it and you're like, this is like a poppy. By the way, that was written in the '80s. I always thought it was older. Um, was that like the tra- uh, Traveling Wilburys? Or um, was it a Roy Orbison cut? It was a Roy Orbison song, but they helped. I think Tom Petty think, helped yeah, write yeah. it, and maybe one of the other guys in the group. Gotcha. But uh, it was released on his stuff. But again, you just hear the. Uh, it's like there was a bridge where all he's doing is just kind of belting out a single note, no words or anything, and you're just like, I. How does he do that? It's impossible to hit that if you're not like a really trained singer. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you start to slowly realize his brilliance when you're just trying to do a little karaoke in your car. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and I, but I was coming across that same you know phenomenon with your album. It's like when you're just starting to hum some of the lyrics, you're like, oh, this guy's putting a lot of flavor on it that I didn't realize at first. You know? <laughs> a little flavor. Yeah, <laughs> you know all those cliche studio words. <laughs> <laughs> Warm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, things that audio engineers can't stand to hear. Uh I just need it warmer. Can you make it tastier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then they just give you the fake knob turn, and they're like, how Uh, about that? And you're like, exactly. Placebo. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Um, You seem very confident with how you wanted this to be. When you were, in 2016, when you were writing that record, do you feel like you had a similar confidence, or maybe you were still searching for a sound, or... Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, I was like 19, 20 years old and just coming off a, you know, a little national TV stint on mm-hmm. The Voice. and um, You were on The Voice? I was. I had no idea. Yeah, a little, little we can skim over that. Okay, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, that, that happened and I wanted to ride that momentum. Mm. And so as soon as I got off in like spring... I wanted, you know, to keep that momentum going. And I only had a few songs in mm. my bag. And those were the songs I had. And, you know, it, it just wasn't this uh, very concentrated, confident effort. It mm. was more of kind of like a, all right, let me put something out to this audience that I just gained, oh, you know. Okay. And, you know, granted, it's, I, I'm, I'll still stand by that work. You know, yeah, I don't think it's bad work, but no, no, no. it's just it's, different. You yeah, know? well, and, and that's what's beautiful about records is I, I think of them as, you know, records, like in, in the the sense of a, like this is a record in time of you right. in those moments. Yeah. And, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's perfect. It's like the songs are good. It's just not who you are anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, um, 
yeah, I mean, even, even that record, like, like I was saying earlier, might have some common threads with this one in that there is some genre hopping, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it has a lot of those rock and then some blues and then some kind of folksy stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, that one, you know, I was still kind of figuring out, you know, as one does in their formative years like that, you know, 1920, early 20s, I was just still trying to figure out what I liked to say in a song on mm -hmm. my instrument and um, lyrically. So, you know, I think this one, I definitely took a lot more time and was more careful about crafting a record that I felt was a proper representation of where I am right now. And, you know, that may change just like mm -hmm. that 2016. But, you know, like you said, it's a, you know, kind of this snapshot in time. And this is where I'm at. I like to listen to this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what comes across on the record. And, um, you know, who knows where it'll go from here. But I'm pretty sure I'm kind of going to stay in this lane for a little while. <laughs> we'll see, Because it right? feels really good, you know. Um, yeah. You know, one major influence is J.J. Kale. Hmm. And um, he, I think, mixed country, blues, and rock and roll so beautifully over the span of his career. And, um, you know, he's he's credited, you know, as a major fluke influence on Clapton, Tom Petty, you know, just oh, wow. really heavyweight guys. And, you know, that's the things about his records that I just think are so timeless. And that's really what I was kind of going after is that sort of timelessness that it, it can exist anywhere, like, um, and in, in any moment, like, I feel like I can put on a JJ Kale record any time of day, time of night, any location like it just has this universal kind of quality to it um and just simple mm -hmm. um so long long story short yeah i feel like this is a lot more <laughs> i can see it man like you you light everything. up when you talk about it like i can yeah. tell you're you're happy about it yeah yeah as you, as you should be um but that's rare you know so many musicians it's like uh well it's like one of the lyrics in uh what was it um one of the lyrics on your album where you're like the the house is kind of like a song it's never finished or something yeah, like that. Never yeah, yeah. Quite done. never quite done yeah yeah and so people feel that way about their albums you know like oh if i could have done that oh done that. always so, yeah. always yeah there was one um thing that was funny we got into the mixing stages and what i do is a song on the record mm -hmm. it's a very country um classic country feel and it's stays in one key the whole song <laughs> but then we got to the mixing stages and i was like man it would have been really cool if we did the typical <laughs> classic country thing and did a modulation for the last <laughs> chorus you know like, yeah that's just what you do you know <laughs> i love the uh I love the irony of the song is called What I'd Do, and you're thinking about what you would do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's some irony there. <laughs> oh, man. Always um, thinking about it. I do want to talk about the the theme of the record, because you sent me, you were kind enough to send me the press release for it, where you talked about your dad passing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm assuming, after reading that, that that's the main theme of the title track, right? And the title of the album? Well, you know, um, the the title track is just, more so a character song. Okay. Just putting on a character. Because that's how I was originally listening to it. And exactly. I was wondering if you, if you were just doing this crafty way of like, it's about your dad, but you can place this on whoever it needs to be. Right. I, and, you know, I did not have that in mind when I wrote it, but um, mm. it, it could definitely be spun that way. Mm. But um, I have written songs about my father. They just hadn't made it out there yet mm -hmm. but um i mean i decided to dedicate this record to my father's memory not because there's a bunch of songs that you know directly address his passing or anything but mm -hmm. i think it's a record that he would ultimately enjoy and then he was just heavy on my heart through the whole you know making of this and kind of whenever he passed in 2021 
I kind of just took a huge step back from life where, and you know, we were in the middle of a pandemic too. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I was already kind of had one step back and then I totally took the other foot out and just, you know, went back for a second and was like, okay, this is one of those moments that changes your perspective on life. Um, you know, someone very near and dear, someone that you just don't imagine losing, um, goes away and just processing it. And the way I processed it was listening to music that he enjoyed and he and I would enjoy together, which was classic country. And, you know, he was from Tulsa, Oklahoma and from Tulsa came JJ Kale and Leon Russell and, so I just dove into everything that dad liked because music is a healer that way, you know? Um, and so I would just listen to the things that we enjoyed and that's the way that this record kind of came together is after a time of me listening to those records, I would start, you know, I think a musician or artist is kind of a result of what they hear. So what I was hearing was all this classic country and kind of a mix of blues and rock and roll, and that's what comes across. It's not so much, um, you know, all tied to my father, but um, I do think he would enjoy some songs, Mm -hmm. and I think he wouldn't enjoy some too. (laughs) I just know it, and it's funny to think about, you know, you just know your parents so well, and... It wouldn't be yeah. a cool record if they liked all of them, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You got to kind of keep that that rock and roll bone in you a little bit. How close was his passing from the time you actually recorded? Um, I'm assuming you would have been recording in like 22, right? About a little over a year. Hmm. Um, so, but man, it, it was about two months of grieving. And then I was like, okay, I'm just going to get back to work, you know, because, you know, um, I took, I feel like I took necessary time and, you know, you kind of always, I don't, I don't know. Um, it seems like I I just have my days, but like I mm. took the time after for a little while and then it was like, okay, things were starting to open up again. I'm going to go back to work, play gigs. And then I, you know, I left my rock and roll group and, um, decided to go a different direction and, just kind of had this open road ahead of me that I could kind of take any turn. It was very freeing that way. And so um, one of the first turns I made was reaching out to Gordy Quist and was like, hey, man, you want to write a tune? And he very graciously said yes. And we wrote a tune really quickly. It turned out to be the title track on the record. And we recorded it in an hour and made this really cool demo that was in October. Dad passed in April. Mm. And, um, you know, at that point it was like, oh yeah, here's, here's a path and I'm going to, you know, kind of keep on going down it and see where it leads. Um, co-wrote some more, um, once with, uh, Dan Dyer and that's another song on the record. Um, it's called growing up and, uh, yeah. So explored co-writing and, um, You know, just found a batch of songs that I had begun writing um, before Dad passed. And then, you know, with Dad's passing, it did give me some time to write some more songs, in Mm -hmm. a way. You know, because I had this um, chunk of time that people understood, okay, yeah, leave him alone for a second. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got something Mm -hmm. to process. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of nice, because... You know, now with having the record out, you know, to find time, it it takes a lot of effort, you know, and and, um, I kind of have to be conscious about it. Whereas during that time, I just kind of left my days wide open Mm -hmm. and didn't feel bad about it. You know, I needed to give myself some time. And with that came these songs and kind of the style that they're written in. And, um, you know, that's kind of where dad's influences on it and um yeah i think uh 
he's probably enjoying it somewhere. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so great to hear, man, that you could turn it like that because so many people can get stuck in the rut, you know, when something horrific like that happens. Yeah. May, uh, may, we don't have to answer it, obviously, but uh, may I ask how he passed? It was complications with lung cancer. He, okay. he enjoyed cigarettes pretty mm, good. Yeah. Um, he was a army veteran and um, from Vietnam. and Yeah, that's um, when you can throw out, like, different generation. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally different generation, but, yeah. And, and how, how old was he? He was 70. 70. Okay, so yeah. you're, he had you fairly late then, huh? He sure okay. did, yeah. yeah. They, he must have been in his 40s, I think. Um, so I was 25 whenever he passed, and, yeah, I can't do all the math right now. Yeah, but, of course. Yeah. But that's still such a rough thing. Like, the average 25-year-old doesn't lose a parent. Yeah, you know? it was strange, man. Yeah. Really strange. But... E- even if they are 70 and have lung cancer, you know, you, yeah. you don't think it's going to be soon. No, yeah. no. And, you know, it's... In a, in a way, it was quick, you know, and terrible as that is, but also it's like, you know, um, you see these dragged on things and it just hurts in a whole a whole different way. So, um, how did know. How did he cope with it towards the end? Was he... Oh, uh, it was, you know, those are things I do not like to remember. Okay, fair know? enough. Well, yeah, we don't have to And it was, you know, just... But I do have just great memories. We did a lot of amazing things, mm-hmm. and you know, um, you know he uh, he was responsible for having guitars in the house. Yeah, you know, um, and so that was kind of my introduction to guitar, and um, he just supported me through and through. We'd go to guitar shows. He'd give me guitar lessons, mm. and um, you know, so he's a just, player as well. I, a little bit. Yeah. He played like cowboy chords and, yeah. you know, just simple country songs. But, um, yeah, I mean, there are just so many good times to look back on, you know, um, th- that far outweigh, mm-hmm. you know, anything that, you know, sort of happened with days that <laughs> I can't imagine myself being in a very good mood in those days either. <laughs> <laughs> good Lord. I uh, It makes me happy to hear that. I have a, a three-year-old. And, um, you know, it's like my wife and I love music, obviously, and we really want him to love music and we really want him to play some instrument, you know? (laughs) Um, but it's like, you know, if you, if it's like, what's that fine line of like forcing it on them, you know, you want them to love it. You want them to want to play, right? right? Do you remember how your dad got you to touch that guitar? Oh, dude, he, he didn't, yeah, he, he was very subtle about it. Uh Um, and and not really forceful. Um, I mean, one of the first bands, the first band that I got into was ACDC. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my dad's a classic country guy, right? <laughs> you know, to hear Brian Johnson go, back and back, you know, <laughs> all the time, just blasting this, like, I had to drive him nuts, man. <laughs> but he still bought me that ACDC guitar tablature book that I so badly wanted, mm, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, would, you know, fan this fire that he saw was kind of igniting in me. Mm-hmm. And even though I know that he didn't care for that stuff, yeah, he he was just like, hey, he's into this. I'm just going to, you know, support it. And that was a really, you know, amazing thing that he did. And then it's just, it kind of cracks me up, you know, uh, you know, after he's passed that I'm playing in country bands now (laughs) and everything like that. Yeah. But now he's looking down at you going like, gotcha. Well, (laughs) exactly. And now he gets to hear it all the time, you know, whereas, you know, he'd be up in Tulsa right now being like, man, I wish I could get down there and hear you. (laughs) Well, you can't all the time now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So but, he was, so he was real subtle about it. He didn't tell you to play. He just kind of no, it was and, around. And, and you know, it was weird. Like at, at, from an early age, I got into blues. You mm-hmm. know, um, yeah. Uh, growing up here in North Texas, guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan were very popular, and um, Freddie King, and you know, some other Dallas blues greats, uh, Bugs Henderson, and then I met a really cool blues player out of Fort Worth and his name was Dennis Dulay who took me under his wing and showed me a lot of blues foundation and 
this wasn't a style of music that dad listened to all the time or mom. Like, it was just something that I gravitated towards for some reason. And he just supported it. And, um, but at the same time, he'd be like, hey, let's listen to some Hank. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to some Merle. And it's not that I didn't like it. It's just that's not what I was into at that time. Mm -hmm. But um, he did kind of explain the importance of those people. Not in like sit down boy you listen <laughs> yeah. to me now like you're yeah. just driving and talking kind of thing yeah just yeah. driving and talking be like you know you hear the simplicity of that you know your cheating heart will mm. make you weep you'll cry and cry and try to sleep there's not much to that it's very simple but powerful mm -hmm. you'd say things like that or you know today I started loving you again I'm right back where I've really always been you know these lines that on the surface, there's not much to them, but the way that they're saying and things like that, these were things that he had said that now I look back on and I'm just like, oh yeah. And then, you know, you see in documentaries now, um, Bob Dylan, I think, said in one, like, he said, uh, they said, I broke the rules of songwriting. If anyone wrote any rules... It was Hank Williams. And so, you know, when guys like that say something about these guys' dad was talking about, mm -hmm. like, I'm listening. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you always look back and think, damn it, dad was right. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, th I think about it a lot because uh, the reason I love music so much is we grew up in a small town and we were constantly commuting everywhere like you know walmart was going to be you know 40 minutes away or something and so oh, you're, yeah. you're always driving somewhere and so there's always a radio on you yeah. know and my mom had her style of music that would be anything from like kind of mainstream pop music but for her mainstream pop music would have been like you know elton john but then she also had like a alice cooper side to her <laughs> and and then my dad was more just you know classic rock through and through yeah, all the yeah. way and um yeah, so it's like that's kind of where it was, but they never said, you know, you have to like this music. So it's like when I started getting into more like alternative music and punk rock music, so it's like they didn't like any of it, but I was still able to keep the music and listen to it. Um, but again, later when I started really paying attention to country music, exactly what you're talking about with the lyrics, it's crazy. Like as you were just saying it, there's a crossover with uh, like I have a lot of comics on the show and there's a crossover between that same sentiment, which is um, a lot of comics the great ones, what makes them great is their choice of words, the, bre oh, yeah. the brevity, right? Like if you can say it in five words instead of 10, say it in five. Oh yeah. And that's such a country, not even necessarily a songwriter and a singer, but just a country person move. That stereotype of like, you sum it up in like four or five words, like, yeah. you know, well, it don't rain on Tuesdays. It's yeah. like, what? It's yeah. like, and it's like, no man, I feel that it doesn't rain on Tuesdays. <laughs> like, right. You know, and they have all these ways of just saying the right amount of words yeah. And no more is needed. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's nice. I mean, it's mm -hmm. easy to memorize, easy to sing along to, and just simple. Um, you it's know, like, it's you like, ever heard somebody giving you a sales pitch on, on something, and you're like, he's talking so much, he, he's got to be full of shit. That and... And country music's the opposite, where you're like, yeah, he's probably right. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, there's there's two sides to the coin. I definitely, like... But I, I do gravitate towards the simpler stuff. But then, like, you know, sometimes like a Robert Earl Keane song or something like yeah. that, you know, it's like there's a lot there, but it's it's really well crafted and it's yeah. pretty interesting in that way, too. But, you know, so there's there's two sides. But generally, you know, that simple stuff, that's that, I, like I said, easier to memorize. Like mm -hmm. it takes me a whole lot longer to memorize a Robert Earl Keane song than it he's, does. A, that's because uh, he's a storyteller in the sense of like, you're drunk sitting around the campfire and he's going to entertain you for an hour just talking yeah. about stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know he hung it up? He's not going to tour anymore? Yeah. That's yeah. wild, man. That's like the end of an era. Well, I think he's putting out a, I think he already put out a new record. Did he? Um, but he's just not going to tour with it? He's just going to yeah, just yeah. chill out and let the music go? Man, there was this crazy article that was in Texas Monthly about 
that last tour. I mean, it was just mm. insane. And he's always had weird luck on the road. And that's why he's like, man, I'm just, yeah. I'm tired of this. His bus caught on fire, man. Oh, yeah. he was sleeping in it. His whole know? life is weird luck, though. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you hear the way he talks about, I mean, I don't, you know, he basically was like a country hippie. You know, and yeah. it's like the success he has is very strange because he doesn't seem like the type of guy to try very hard. <laughs> he just he just resonates with the right people, you know, yeah. and he's made a career out of it. And again, like you were talking about earlier, he's not a household name, but he has had just an incredibly successful career. Exactly. Yeah. And the people who love him love him. Dude, we went to uh, my wife and I like him like, you know, yeah. we're not obsessed, but we think he's great. And we saw him at a regular concert. We saw him at a show after a uh, Texas Rangers game. And then just for kicks, we went to one of his Christmas shows because he did, Ooh, he did a Christmas show over here. Yeah. And you're right, man, the fans, the, the real fans, like when he came out on the Christmas show, the stage was decorated with all these Easter eggs from all of his songs that everybody knew, you know? Yeah. And um, it's like, it, it's one of those incredible shows where, you know, 70, 80% of the crowd is singing every word the whole time. Man, and that, I've been to a few shows like that that I haven't seen uh, Robert Earl Keen, but, you know, a couple different shows. Like, I saw Lyle Lovett and Hayes mm. Carl at the Majestic. Hayes Carl. Years. Oh, man, Love. he's so great. And yeah. that was a show that I saw here in Dallas at the Kessler recently. Mm -hmm. And, man, it was that. Like, people just singing really loud. And, man, I just, that's, it's like, that's what I want to do right there, you know? It's like. Yeah. Man. Hayes Hayes Carl is one of those people, like when we were talking earlier about um, marketing, he's one of those people I would love to talk to him and ask how much direction he's got from somebody who is telling him how to market himself because he's so unique and interesting. And I wonder sometimes if he tries to write a hit rather than just like, give me the weird shit that's in your head, you know, because he's a very, well, he's a very unique guy. I feel like you get that with like the span of his records, like, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Flowers and Liquor, and then uh, Trouble in Mind, they kind of have that um, country flavor, yeah. um, you know, uh, writer that comes out of, you know, these Robert Earl Keen, Lyle Lovett kind of, you know, Texas songwriter tradition, Guy Clark. Mm -hmm. And then um, K Mag Yo Yo was kind of during, um, I think that was during, you know, Operation Desert Storm and all that stuff, mm -hmm. like um, kind of during the Ar Iraq War. And so he kind of took this like political stance and K Mag Yo Yo and stuff like that. That song is wild. Have you heard that one? No. Uh uh. I'll so have to listen to it's, it. It's just a very um, cool, creative approach to a uh, military um, uh, career, yeah. uh, so to speak, you know. And um, yeah, it's, it's somewhat comical. And um, but yeah, he's. He's got a lot of different um, characters that mm. he can put on. And we, we've watched him. Wear. We've watched him a lot, and uh, he's so much more talented than like he's successful, but yeah. he should definitely have more success, in my opinion. Um, he's really like we we watched him by accident at several festivals. You know, he got on those circuits for a while. He's probably the person I've watched the most. Believe it or not, I mean, I don't can't even count how many times we watched him. But we got to watch him at um, Austin City Limits, the venue, not the festival in Austin. Oh, man. And that was maybe one of the best shows I've ever watched. The The performance was incredible, you know. And he's another one of those, you know, between songs, he's got stories that you just kind of can't believe are real. Oh, he's so good. Man. You know, and you're just like, God, man, I feel like I could just listen to you tell the stories. We don't even need the music right now, but I, I also want the music, right? <laughs> you know. Um, but it, it bothers me so much that guys like that aren't household names. Right. And, and I but, always, I always wish I could get their opinion on, you know, what do you think kind of holds it back? You know, as the guy who's living it, um, obviously that's hard to ask without being like offensive, but you know, right. And then, you know, like, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but right. I genuinely think he should just be more popular than he is. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Big fan, big fan myself. He's he's another one with a weird voice, right? It's uh not I shouldn't say weird, but um totally unique. The it's, the it it's almost like he's the uh Captain Jack Sparrow of country music, like the way he <laughs> slurs those words so perfectly, right? That's funny, man. You know I, what I mean, that's that's how I picture him. 
it, it's just the words. He knows how to drag them, and, uh, yeah. and he knows how to lay it on thick, but it never that sounds a, cheesy. That is a cool comparison. <laughs> I, I can I can kind of hear that, man. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, he sings the way Jack Sparrow runs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you still get there. Yeah, the job's getting done, but he took away nobody else takes. <laughs> yeah, man, it it is such a cool um, delivery and. You know, you never feel like he's putting you on. No. You know, it's it's just that just sounds like haze. You yeah. know, it sounds like you know someone. Um, you know, like you said with Robert Earl, you know, campfire entertainment in mm-hmm. a way. You know, it, it's it's sounds like a friend. Yes, you know more than like uh, oh, I have spent years of my life polishing my voice. <laughs> you know, it's not that. I'm, yeah. I've, I'm singing a country song over some country chords that's what i'm doing yeah um it it and that's nice man you know it's and you know but not to take away like you know someone like a ray charles that Mm. like sang country music in this amazing way but like it's really cool listening to guys like Hayes or Guy Clark or Towns Van Zandt that mm-hmm. they're not star vocalists, but that's not really what it's about. You know, it's it's yeah. it's just about a story and, um, you know, these simple melodies that, man, they make you cry more than, you know, a, a Mariah Carey note's going to make <laughs> me cry, man. Like, Yeah, I think that's the key, right, is if you can sing like that, if you can, if you are an amazing singer and do it right but right. if you're not an amazing singer that doesn't keep you from being no a great song and that's what and bob dylan just proved everyone <laughs> wrong you know? I, I love his voice you i know? i still refuse to go see him live right now oh my god i would love it I, some somebody i can't remember who i was talking to on the show but somebody was telling me they went and saw him and they were like dude it's different but it's great because i was like i just don't want to ruin any well, view i i love him i think he's phenomenal and um i was like i kind of just have this opinion of him now and i want to keep it that way have you heard that new record though no my I rough haven't. and rowdy mm-hmm. ways good stuff i think it's really cool okay. i mean ever since like time out of mind that came out in 95 everything he's been putting out has been kind of bluesy almost like a kind of in a tom waits bag of just kind of bar house blues country mm-hmm. rusty sounding and of course he's putting on that gravelly thing that he's doing yeah i don't know if he's putting it on uh, maybe that's just where his voice is at now yeah. but um yeah you never know with him the guy who brought electric guitar into the mainstream of that style it's like you don't know if he's doing what he does or if he's working with what he's got well i you know everything that he's done over the years i think it's just incredibly brave and he just does like we've been kind of saying all along here it's just he just is who he is Mm -hmm. at any point in time and he's not i mean his records kind of can sound like you know whenever you listen to stuff from the 80s it kind of sounds like it was in there and Mm -hmm. part of that's production where you know equipment was and things of that nature but his lyrical like ability and everything like that and wherever his voice went it you know it's just where bob wanted to go it's not where anyone else wanted him to go it's he just was like, yeah, I'm gonna, you know. I do love this now. I love punk rock music, and that's what I love about Bob Dylan so much. Is like he was making punk rock decisions before the genre existed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He was went right when people were like, oh, so you're this guy. He he's pretty much just like, what? No, I'm whatever I want to be, man. Like don't don't label me. And he would yeah, just do yeah. whatever felt right to him. Yep. And um, you know, it's like you watch those documentaries where like Pete Seeger's talking about cutting the cord to his amps and stuff with an axe because he's playing a guitar at this uh, an electric guitar at this folk festival and have you seen that full um no direction home documentary oh yeah it's like a six hour yeah Mm -hmm. i mean there's so much great um so many great interviews and b-roll footage of people who were living with bob during those times yeah it's incredible to think like you listen to those records now and you don't realize like how many feathers he ruffled making that music because a lot of it seems so tame now when you've and it's like, yeah, a lot of this music is the product of the changes that he made, you yeah. know, along with other bands and other artists. But he was a big influence on so many of the people. You know, the fact that Hendrix respected him so much. It's, yeah. You know, it's think about where Hendrix might be if he didn't have a Bob Din- Dylan influence. Right. You know, it's it's just it runs so deep. Yep. Yep. And 
yeah, just fearless, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I, of course, I mean, he had to know that, like, that's going to ruffle some feathers, but yeah. doing it anyways. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to rewatch that whole, it's been like 10 years since I've watched it. Have but... you seen the Rolling Thunder review one? Mm, no, that doesn't sound familiar. That's... I don't think so. I don't know if Scorsese did that one or not. I think he did. But um, that's about the Rolling Thunder review, the tour he did in 75, oh. which is incredible. Okay. If, have you heard any of those recordings? Uh-uh. No, no. This no. is during, like, Blood on the Tracks had just come out, and um, he assembled this incredible band. Hmm. And um, one North Texas boy got in there, uh, T-Bone Burnett. Oh, okay. And then later on had a very successful career in his own right. Um, But, yeah, he had an incredible band and just had this new inspiration, but that's also a great documentary you should Mm, check out. I'll check it out. So it it actually came out with really great music then? Oh, my God. Yeah, because it's so, you know, it's so hard. Like, people form supergroups sometimes, and it just doesn't just doesn't click you know man that band goes hard that's awesome okay. it is the most rock and roll bob dylan you've ever heard okay, in your cool. life I'll and definitely like check he, it out. he sings with such conviction more than ever like mm. he's like yelling and like hitting notes in that microphone that like you've never heard bob like bob's mad man you know <laughs> like this is amazing yeah i wonder what guys like him think about you know music nowadays and just where it's all headed, you know, whether they love it, whether they, you know, it, it'd be great to get a mature opinion from somebody who's been in the business, you know, 50 years, you know, him, yeah. Willie Nelson, if Prince was still alive, people like that who have just been a part of it for so long and, and seen things come and go and yeah. could, could drop wisdom on younger guys about like, you know, don't worry about that. This is probably what's true and what's going to happen because it's so easy, uh, you know, like every five or 10 years to be like, this new music sucks, <laughs> you know, and it's, and that's not really what it is. You know, it doesn't really suck. It's just not for you. Yeah. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to get somebody, you know, of that, uh, caliber to just discuss new music. I heard Prince in an interview once talk mm-hmm. about new music and, uh, he's like, I don't really listen to new music. He's like, I stay in my studio and I don't think there's a lot of good music out there right now. So I just write good music that I would prefer to listen to. Like, you know, I'm paraphrasing of course, but of course you do. <laughs> but he was just like, I just write music that I want to listen to because I don't think anyone's writing good music. <laughs> well, there's something to be said for that. I mean, yeah. um, you certainly wouldn't want to listen to somebody if they didn't think it was good, <laughs> right. I guess, you know, yeah, but, yeah. um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, c- I can maybe relate a little bit with what Prince had said, you know, yeah. but like, because I mostly listen to older music, but you know, I, I do listen to some of the new guys and, and a lot of it's really cool. It's just not widely popular by any means. Like we're saying about like, Hayes yeah. Carl, it's like amazing stuff, but you know, not a, a, a super household name. And then, you know, uh, I don't know. There's, there's just a lot of good music that, yeah, it's it's not the Beatles or Prince, mm-hmm. you know, but it's good to somebody. Yeah. And, you know, that's okay. But it might not be okay if you want a Maserati in the garage, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, it, you know, it's, I don't think it's about that or anything that those guys are thinking about at the time when they're trying to record it or whatever. Yeah, it seems it seems so insurmountable if you're talented and unheard of to get to get out there in front of people you know it seems it just seems so difficult to spread the word like there's more luck now involved than ever yeah and um, maybe it's always been that way again that's why i'd love to talk to you know somebody who's been in the business that long to go like no no, it's always been like this or oh no it's definitely that way now yeah yeah i'd be interested to hear that too i try to listen to some podcasts with people i look up to and stuff like that too like you know these massive names that you know, you'd like their outlook on things, but I never really, I can't recall mm-hmm. an answer to that question. But if you um, had it your way with this record, what would be the move that you would want? Would it be touring or would it just be getting the record in people's hands some way? Or like what, what in your mind would be the way you would prefer it work for your career? Man, I, you know, I think if I, hmm. You know, sometimes I think if I think too much about that, you know, um, 
it's probably not going to end up that way anyways, you know, something, <laughs> something else is probably bound to happen, but, um, and be a whole lot better than whatever I had in mind. But, um, I, I would like to be touring a lot more, um, with this record, you know, we did everything we could to try to get some kind of agent manager, all that kind of business team, but it just didn't come together right now and that's okay Mm. and so i've kind of taken everything on myself and you know i just didn't want to sit on this record for two or three years and then in two or three years and put it out with that team and not be excited about it i wanted to be excited about this that's a really smart move you know you know and i know it's not going to be the last record i make Mm -mm. so just get it out and and i'm working really hard to do whatever i can do and you know, I'm playing in Austin and Houston and surrounding areas and trying to branch out of Texas a little bit and just kind of get break into regional markets or whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean, I would love to be on tour. I think I could um, entertain certain audiences mm-hmm. quite well. But, um, you know, you have to kind of... I had to accept certain things that were happening with as we were trying to shop this record, it's like, okay, well, that's not going to happen right now. And that's, I think it's going to take someone you know. who loves music, has reasonably deep pockets and is willing to take a risk because it's, it's, it's not music that you like for now. It's music that you love or you don't. Right. You know, and, and that, I mean, I mean that in a very positive way, you yeah. know? Um, and, uh, like my wife and I, you know, she's always my, like, anytime we're talking about music, we go to her, but, like, uh, I was trying to think of what venues I would want to watch you in, you know, like yeah. if, if, if it was all going the way, but, and I told her, I was like, man, it's just, it's kind of the band I wish was at these, uh, like, it would be great to see you on massive, large stages just because I, at that point I would know you would have success and it would be great, but I would almost love to be able to walk into eight airs or something like that, like a little hole in the wall that just, where it's like, oh, this is the place that always has the good music and then when we walk in it's like oh perfect matt tedder's here yeah we're gonna be here about two hours now oh yeah um now that's not necessarily the way to make money but (laughs) right but it is how you get diehard music fans you know and and i say that like uh charlie crockett that's how he was around here yeah yeah. Uh, i don't know how familiar you are with him but we would see him in the small dive bars just entertaining people playing the music he wanted to play and then it, it just slowly built his following and he was just working on it now he probably I'm saying that as somebody who watched it on the outside, you know, he right. if you get a chance to talk to him, he probably has a lot more to say about however he made it work, but uh right. it was an experience knowing like, oh man, he was just we got to see him in these spots and he was still playing it like it was a 5000 seat venue, you know. Man, giving it his all kind of thing. Um so it's I hope that you have a path like that. Well, how did your show at uh Tulips go? That's that was that your was, album release show? Yeah. I was kicking myself for not being able to get out there. Man, I really really wanted to see it. It was a good time. I I got video of the whole thing. You so did? I'll, I'll definitely throw those up Hell on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Um but um yeah, uh that was great and that's a that's a nice size club, you mm-hmm. know. I think the capacity is like 3 to 400 people, you know. We you know, got about half that, but, um, you know, that's still a lot of people and, you know, for a local release, you Mm -hmm. know, I thought that was really cool. And, you know, my hometown came out and in stride, it was, it was a really great night. And, um, you know, places like that, I really like, you know, I've seen, and that's really, you know, just about the size that I like to see. And, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I like a Toyota Music Factory act, you know, I've seen some good shows there, but like, you know, once it gets to Dos Equis Pavilion size level, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you're disconnected. It's almost disconnected, you know, mm-hmm. and so like, I crave connection. I've been on all, I haven't been on Toyota Music Factory, but I played guitar for somebody um, at Dos Equis and we were opening. It was like, um, we were like the third opener Mm -hmm. or something like that you know very first of the evening and then the headliner was two acts later so you know here's this massive venue and people are you know still making their way to their seats Mm -hmm. with their popcorn and you know yeah expensive beer and all that and (laughs) like you know there's just so many gaps in that audience that you can see and that was cool granted being on that stage but 
you know, it's not the feeling that you get whenever you're in a room like the Kessler Mm -hmm. and that thing's packed and you finish the song, everyone claps, then they get quiet and then you can tell a story that might have a punchline and just, man, the laughs Mm -hmm. and, or whatever, you know, it's just, there's these rooms that have this connection kind of built into them. And, but also that can happen with a massive venue as well that, um, you know, what's, what's hard with like those Dos Equis places. So your point about being able to like the crowd, when you're at the Kessler, if you're, you know, engaging and people came there to see you, people will be quiet and like people will open up a beer quieter if you're talking. Right. right? Whereas at places like the big, you know, fairgrounds type amphitheaters and stuff, there's always just this background like, Right. You know, people just talking. Oh, yeah. Get me a beer. Hey, do you have that? Who's coming up on this time? Yeah. And are we driving home? Are we riding? With you? There's just always That's a very difficult thing to do. Going. Yeah. It's never quiet. It's, yeah. It's never, you can't achieve that. Um, and so, yeah, that's. I would really yeah. like, you know, with this record, I would, and just career wise, like, I mean, I wouldn't mind um, just making a career out of venues like the Kessler all across the country and you know internationally because those types of places are amazing Mm -hmm. and small theaters to mid-sized to large like I was gonna say I could see you I could see you being a great experience on a stage like the Majestic downtown Dallas have you have you seen that before I saw that that was Lyle Lovett and Hayes Carl and that was just beautiful I mean we had nosebleeds but man that thing was built Mm-hmm. beautifully like mm-hmm. there's really not a bad seat in the nope. house you know and it just sounded amazing and even even though it's probably like i don't know what do you think that is like 1500 people or something maybe so yeah, yeah. It, but the artist you know the shows i've seen there it's like you still feel like they're talking right to you oh yeah you know what i mean even yeah. though they're rows and rows away yeah. um it doesn't so something about the way they design those theaters that, oh, yeah. that to me that is the biggest like music or comedy should ever get is that size Right. I, I think that's right. your maximum. And then we do like multiple nights. You yeah. Know, that's what they do at the Ryman in Nashville. Yeah. You know, a lot of these acts, they'll put, they'll have these residencies. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's super cool, you know. And um, I mean, the Grateful Dead would do that sometimes too, you know, and just have so many nights in a row. And yeah, I mean, instead of playing arenas yeah. that sound awful, mm-hmm. of course, yeah, it's cool you're playing an arena, but like, Man, they just don't sound good. Every, all that sounds just bouncing around, no matter how many people get in there, you know. And I don't know. Technology has come a long way to where it's getting better, but you know, I, my rule of thumb is if you have to put a screen up for somebody to watch, then yeah. then it's too big. Yeah. Right. So like, whatever the biggest you can get, where no one needs a, a screen to see your face. I like that. Idea. I think that's it. Right. If you can manage that with. 5,000 people, however you design your venue, fantastic. Because mm-hmm. um, that, that to me is the connection point. It's like if you're watching a TV, if you paid a ticket to watch a TV, <laughs> that kind of sucks. You're tailgating the concert, basically. Yeah. Um, and I know some people love it, you know, and that's fine. But yeah. I kind of wish artists, uh, when they get huge and have made their money and are successful, I wish they would just go do like a string of club tours. Man, I think that's cool what the Foo Fighters will do sometimes. Is you that know? what do they do that? I mean, they'll do that. That's and badass. and even the Stones, like they'll mm. they'll have warm up gigs, like small gigs in LA. Black Crows did that on a recent tour. Like they played the Troubadour, yeah. I think, and um a place out in New York too. And you know, it's just the those big acts will do that. That's but awesome. But they just don't do it often well i mean i get you know? it you can play one show at an arena and make a shitload of money right or you can play four shows at a club and not make the same money and yeah, be but, tired but it feels so good i think that you way know? but <laughs> yeah 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 i mean yeah i try to put myself in their shoes like we watched uh willie nelson at the granada we got really ooh. we got really lucky i was literally like in my email on my phone and the granada sent out an email going like pre-sale tickets right now so i bought two for me and my wife and as soon as I bought those, I was like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an asshole. I should get two more. Somebody else is going to want to come with us. Yeah. And as soon as I went to go back to get those two, it was sold out. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it was just, I happened to be in my email the moment it came across. And uh, he got up there, he played, show was great, and he was ending his show. And I was like, I looked at my wife and I was like, man, that kind of sucks. Like, he's he's ending already? 
Yeah. And she looks at me and she's like, I think he's like 80. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's like 11 o'clock or whatever. I was like, yeah, that, no, he's fine. He's fine. I forgot he's For a sure. geriatric old man who, <laughs> who's trying to get through his guitar parts with his arthritis still. And it's, you Oh know, dude, but he does great. I it think. was phenomenal. I've seen him, uh, I was there on his 89th birthday there at oh, Luck. Oh, nice. And man, he, I, it was like a four piece. It was well, him. Well, that's why she was reminding me because yeah. he was so good that I yeah. I had to be reminded like you do know he's in his eighties, you yeah. know. And it's like, well, he doesn't play or sing like that though. He doesn't, you know. He's so good still, man. And that just comes from loving it, you know. And mm-hmm. what a what an amazing thing for him to just keep doing it, even though he probably doesn't have to. He doesn't have to do shit. You know, it's pretty cool that he still does it, and you know. That's that's amazing. You could tell he really loved his fans at that show because he had like one of the little gimmicky things that he did, which if it was anybody else, I would kind of scoff at. But I know he deeply means it, you know, but he would like, you know, he threw his headband into the crowd and people go crazy. Right. I got Willie Nelson's headband. And then he immediately like he had like five or six of them on an amp or something. And he'd like wear it for like 45 seconds and then throw it out to another person in the crowd. And they're all losing their mind. Everybody's freaking out, you know. And it's like such a cheesy rock star move, but it's like when you're looking at him throwing them, he's just as psyched to like he know he knows that like I have a life where I get to wear a bandana for 45 seconds and someone loses their mind about receiving it, you know. Like he, you can tell yeah. he really appreciates that that uh, life that he has, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it was so. It's like just watch. I was like, and, and it wasn't when I say freaking out. They were freaking out in the way that, like, a teenage girl would freak out about, like, Harry Styles. Yeah. And so watching, like, a 50-year-old woman freak out that she got the Willie Nelson headband is just a sight to see, man. Like, it's just cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rock star, uh, man, you know, never, never known what that's feel, felt like. <laughs> Um, was that the first time at Tulips that you got to play uh, like with a full band with this album? No, um, I've I've had quite a few different bands at this point now since. No, no, I um, mean specifically with this record. Um, well, yeah, I mean, since even before I recorded the record, you know, having all the songs, I was kind of rehearsing a band we had played in Fort Worth, and then mm. had the band assembled for the record, and then. Once we recorded, I'm really busy, man. I play, you know, just about five nights a week. Oh, wow. Either guitar for somebody or just, you know, patio gigs or whatever. You know, this is my only work. So um, I work all the time. And so sometimes I would play as myself and hire a band and play these songs. So I definitely played with a band plenty of times with this record, if unreleased. Mm-hmm. Um you know, working up to it and just calling different guys, you know, it's kind of a a blessing and a curse as a solo artist, you know, there's, um, but also, I mean, I just get to play with a lot of really talented dudes and, um, that also become friends and, um, it's cool. It's, you know, a networking thing too, you know, they're in different bands and, you know, it's really cool to, to meet everybody, you know, for example, like, I had a band in Fort Worth here in Tulips uh, for the release show. I got a completely different one this coming weekend in Austin mm. at the White Horse. Like, yeah. um, and you know, rehearsing them and everything like that. But um, that's it's been nice um, having a career in music for years and years and years. It's not you know um, foreign to me to walk into a room of strangers as players and then walk out and we can get along just fine all the parts are there you know so do you remember when jack white had the guy band and the girl band Mm -mm. so when he released um it was either lazaretto or blunderbuss i can't remember which one um where he started doing his solo stuff and uh he was wearing it, it had to have been the first record which i think was blunderbuss but uh he had a full band of women and he had a full band of men and he would mm. just some shows would be one, some shows would be the other. Hmm. And he felt like it gave his shows a difference, like something to just change it up, you know? He's you, such a salesman <laughs> kind of craftsman. Like, yeah. 
brand artist to like he's really good at that um and but, i like those ideas you but know? you're accidentally doing that right you got a <laughs> different band in fort worth and a different band in austin yeah so when you go like when you're rehearsing with the different groups do you get different expectations because you know there's different styles with these players or how do, how does how does that go when you're changing band members i try to um keep do you my, say like this is the record i need it to be like this or is it a little loose to some extent mm-hmm. like i i do you know, I don't want to be, you know, uh, uh, a Hitler band leader of just like, this was the way it has to be. Yeah. You know, to an extent, yes, follow the structure of the song that has been recorded. And, and then from there, like, we can maybe take it some different places. But, um, no, I, I try to just kind of come in and, you know, first of all, I'm pretty dang sure at this point with, most of the people that I talk to and trust about getting these recommendations from guys and everything like that, I already kind of have this expectation. Like, oh, if he was recommended by that guy, mm. he's gonna be he's gonna be all right, you know. So I'm not like too worried about it. Um, and usually that's the case, you know. We, from the first song, it's like, oh yeah, this is gonna be fine. And then, um, so I don't really try to walk in with too much expectation. Um, but I will, you know, give direction if they're if it's needed, mm-hmm. and you know I think pros take it well, you know, is, and and that's, and, you know, I've been in that seat, I've been a sideman plenty of times, so you know I I I take no offense to like oh turn down or don't play so much or play more or whatever, you know, um, I think, uh, yeah. Um, having all these different guys it's logistically somewhat of a nightmare but Mm. um i mean it does make for um kind of i i guess it makes the maybe makes the songs a little bit new to me each time we do it you know and um in a way i have to be very uh knowledgeable about what's happening with my own music so that i can you know uh explain it well to them but um yeah i mean it's it's a lot of fun most most of the time you Mm -hmm. know and uh most of the things that the the coolest things that happen during a show are the things that you don't plan for so um try to leave some room for that yeah when um when you're going to rehearse with these like let's just say this Austin group that you're 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 getting ready for this show. Do you come into a rehearsal expecting them to like have you know have have like you have a set list? I need you to know these before, and we're just going to run through them. Or are you kind of going through teaching the song in the moment? No, set list uh, is nice to have before. Mm-hmm. And today I spent hours learning their songs. It's kind of a co bill. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, this weekend uh, is with the Tender Things. And they're a really cool rock and roll band there in Austin. Mm-hmm. They've got, you know, some country styled songs too. So um, we're kind of doing some of my songs, some of their songs. So they've already learned all my songs. Okay, I played with them a week or two ago, mm-hmm. and they were outstanding. That's awesome. And so now we're going down, um, man. It's gonna be a day. I can I can visually see you getting excited about it. Oh, though. dude! It's like oh, as you're talking great. about like we rehearsed. It was like you're literally getting a smile on your face. Yeah, but you, you know, know, and then it's it's just so cool. I, I you know, one day I I would like to kind of have somewhat of like a Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers mentality that you kind of keep people together, and mm-hmm. and then there becomes this dependency on one another, and and that relationship and chemistry keeps growing and growing. But right now, I just can't financially do that. And mm-hmm. I don't expect any musician to be like, yeah, man, it's just you, you know, <laughs> for, you know, $600 a month I'm making right. off of you, you know, <laughs> right. like, yeah, I'm not going to expect you to commit for that, you know. So um, anyways, uh, so, I mean, I just get to play with really cool people. Like this band at Tulips the other night was just outstanding. And um, everyone who played on the record, I mean, that's that's what's been kind of liberating as a solo artist is like discovering these people that i'm like wow they're an amazing player Mm -hmm. i'm gonna call him up see if he wants to play with me sometime you know and um 
you know, or write with, you know, um, it's, it's been really fun that way. And, um, so yeah. And, and DFW has, there's just a lot of phenomenal players yeah. that people don't realize are out there. And it's like, you know, I, I feel like I keep a decent eye. I mean, we have a kid now, so we don't get to get out as many shows as we used to, but it's, I, you know, I would start going, Oh, that guy's played bass for these four bands that I've seen, you know, and, yeah. and bouncing around and you start to realize it's like, God, there's so many good people that you just don't know are that good. And then when you start watching and you start seeing how versatile they are and how many different styles they've played and played yep. well. Yep. And then you realize like, and there's a whole category of other people that I've never even seen that are just that good too. And uh, it's it's such a thriving music scene that I feel like goes under the radar a lot. Well, I mean, you know, it's just kind of the nature of it. You know, mm-hmm. we if if you're going to do this thing full time, you got to play a lot. Yeah. And um, that's just, but... Like you said, you got a kid. You're not going to go see a band on a Tuesday night. But my wife may, and I, maybe not. My wife and I have an understanding. She right. knows that I love this stuff. I do a podcast. If it's a show, like I, I pick my battles. I pick which shows I'm going to for sure. But if I'm like, I really got to go to this one. She's like, okay. Yeah. And then you know, I do my part. Like if the show's on a Tuesday, then Some, on Wednesday and Thursday, I'm going to try to get her free time. But for sure, I think I think that's a. Uh, but like that. That being said, you know, you you take those nights of the week certain like you're you're on with the family mm-hmm. and there's one show a week mm-hmm. but these musicians man i mean they're all over town five nights a week you know and yeah i mean unless you're just a, a creep <laughs> you, you know you're, you're, you're not gonna be there for all of them you know yeah i uh i think a lot about our our local scene or just any scene in general like um how to motivate people to go to more shows and, and be involved because I think a lot of people listen to people's music and they love it, but maybe there's a disconnect in terms of they don't understand how much like a ticket sale or a vinyl purchase or a mm. t-shirt purchase really makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've been trying to think, I've been working on this written piece of how, you know, basically saying like, you know, I want to find a way to basically say like, if you love the thing, like whatever your hobby is, it's like you almost have to make an effort now to motivate yourself to go out and experience those things. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, those things will go away. You know, like if you if you play the show at Two Ups and you only get 20 people, Two Ups isn't going to book you again. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that's just the nature of the beast. It's not their fault. Mm-hmm. And so it's like as a fan, it's like you should think to yourself like, man, if, if that scrolls through your feed on Instagram and you love it, find a way to get a ticket to that. Or if you can't go to it, go like, do they have a vinyl? Do they have a shirt? Do they have something tangible I can purchase? and show a little bit of support, especially now that streaming is so huge and it's so hard to make the necessary buck to fund tours and albums and all the things that, you know, lower level artists need to just get going, yeah. you know? I mean, just pressing vinyl. Mm-hmm. Anytime I see a band that I like that has vinyl, I'm like, okay, uh, next paycheck, I'm buying that one. Yeah. Because you know how expensive it is to just to print it. Just the most basic one, yeah. you know, takes so much money. Um. So I've been trying to figure out how, you know, you, you motivate people to go like, I know it's a Wednesday, but if you really love that thing, whatever it is, just try to get out there, you know, try to get out there and do it, be a little tired for work tomorrow. It's all going to work out. You're not going to remember the work day, but you will remember the thing you went and saw. Right. And without it being too gimmicky. Right. You know, um, yeah, I don't want it to seem like a pep rally, you know, right. it just, but it's so, you know, like we're so fortunate in Dallas and Fort Worth that we have all these venues. Right. And it would be great to see them full more often. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I have no idea. I know. I don't you either. Know? I just, you know, I, I just bounce it off people and hope I get a great idea someday. Man. <laughs> yeah. It, it's. Well, if you could have one thing right now uh, for, for your solo project, what is one thing that you think would help in just such an immense way? for your career with your solo project? What would be a big, like, if I had this, it would change a lot of what I'm doing Hmm. that we don't currently have going on? Man. Man, I could, I feel like I could pop off all day on a (laughs) a bad day. Right now I'm, I'm, really happy that i'm here on this podcast and someone's oh, taking notice you. you know and yeah. but um man 
I mean, we have venues, we have people here. Yeah, you know, they're your song. You talking about like locally or like whatever just you want, whatever, whatever yeah. I want. Yeah, um, yeah. What what would be the thing? You know, like in your eyes. I mean, I I think better, um, hmm, just some sort of like national uh, outreach. You mm-hmm. know, um, just kind of where I'm being noticed a little bit more outside of Texas. Yeah. You know, uh, and I've, I've got a little bit of that, but, um, you know, certain records come out and they're in every record store nationally because, you know, certain, uh, that's, I guess like a label thing or, mm-hmm. or something like that. But, um, I, I, I do think like business team would be great, you know, manager, agent, um, that sort of thing would be incredible mm-hmm. because, you know, I, I do spend a lot of my time doing that kind of stuff. You know, I get up in early in the morning now and like, you know, if I'm not staying on top of merch, no one else is. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm not getting online and searching venues to book, no one else is. Mm-hmm. If I'm, you know, not promoting myself on social media, no one else is. So and I'm the only one doing this thing right now. Yeah. And if I had like two or three other people. You know, mm-hmm. that would be incredible. And I feel like everything would just work, you know, more economically mm-hmm. and and more efficiently and uh, more effectively with just growth. I think growth is happening with my career. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm very fortunate to say that and, and have worked really hard to get to this point. But um, I feel like in order to grow more, like, there just needs to be some more heads on this yeah. beast because as an artist and any independent artist will tell you this, it's a lot of work, but I mean, I wouldn't, ra- I wouldn't rather be doing anything else, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's just a lot of things that an artist is doing that's not playing music mm-hmm. or not creating music. Now, granted they need to be done and, um, um, glad that there are things to do that need to be done because people want to see me and, you know, I need to respond to these emails and things like that. But, you know, a lot of that stuff, it's so administrative Mm -hmm. that like, you know, someone else could easily be doing that and I could be over here writing a song or whatever. But, you know, for right now, um, you know, until that right person comes along and, and, and it's the right fit, you know, I've, I've had meetings and they just didn't feel right. And, Mm. you know, and that's not something you really want to rush into. I don't think it's smart to just give up 15% just because they have a name or whatever. And you're only making this record once. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't. Well, who knows? I mean, there are cases of people that like, you know, they put out a record and it's very independent. And then later on they do sign with a label and then they'll re-release it because, I mean, this is just, you know, I mean, let's be real, this record that I just put out, a very limited amount of people have heard this record. I mean, you know, uh, it's just not that wide of a reach yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I dream of it doing that one day, but it could very easily be re-released, I think. Well, I don't mean re-released. I just mean you wouldn't want to get it tied up in a bad deal where somebody's holding it captive and you're not able to keep it out there. And that's what I didn't know. You know, know, that's something that I feel... Um, and I think it's, it might make a a manager type or agent or whatever. It might make their job a little easier if you've done it yourself a little while and know how to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, okay, we've seen how you do it. We can do that. Yeah. Instead of them just having to constantly bounce back and forth to you. Like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And not getting anywhere. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, you know that you know, these bigger acts, you know, they're not sitting there booking or, no, you know, they're not doing any of that shit. Doing just crunching merch numbers, you yeah. know, they're, yeah. they're not any, they're not doing that, you know, yeah. so. They're not figuring out how to do their taxes off of the albums they oh, sold and everything. Oh, God, dude. <laughs> I just got that email. Can from I write the off strings? Yeah, I, yeah. Can write, I think I can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. And I've, I've, I've had to figure that out, and that's that's good because, yeah. I mean, if you're if you're gonna do this for a living, those are things you need to know about. Yeah. And I feel like 
a manager is not going to want to walk, hold your hand through that thing. Some are going to for like, you know, the next Taylor Swift to like, <laughs> but you know, for, you know, a guy that's approaching his thirties, they're going to be like, come on, you don't know how to do your taxes. Come on. You know? Yeah. But you can always just go, I'm a musician, man. I'm yeah. an artist. Oh <laughs> man. What a, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like that's the best, uh, <laughs> Uh, excuse in the world anymore yeah. you know it's it's a job like anything else and there are things about work like man this this is probably somewhat of a job to you you know yes and, yeah and this like, takes a lot of time it takes a lot of time yeah. like right now this is the fun part mm-hmm. but then you're you're here editing the video you're you're you know and uploading and and something might break and oh man come Mm -hmm. come back out to dallas we got to re-record this thing you know sometimes things go wrong and there's work things about it yeah so i mean there's always going to be work but um could be easier yeah (laughs) i i you know uh like i said this show has comics and musicians on it that's that's kind of my two you know biggest loves are comedy and music and uh my background is in music uh i've never performed as a comic and i don't intend to but there's a lot of parallels, and, and I, I think a lot about the, um, I feel like we lack infrastructure in terms of people. So, like, the people you're talking about, you know, that could help you with those things. I think there's a lot of people who love artistic ventures that are not very artistic themselves, that don't realize, like, that could be the way you're joining in, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Maybe you don't play an instrument and you love music. Okay, well, here's a musician talking about, man, I would love some type of, you know, marketing help or something. And it's like, if you're a marketing major and you love music, it's like, maybe you should take a chance on this artistic side of stuff that doesn't seem lucrative at the start, but you could build it into something that you love that is lucrative. Right. You know, because, um, for instance, people like Dave Grohl, Jack White, those are, those are obviously like the top of the pyramid, um, Mm -hmm. in terms of success stories, but, they make terrible business decisions and it pans out for them because at some point, you know, it's like third man records. A lot of the stuff they do would not make sense on paper, but there's such a cult following with people because they know like, this is going to be incredible. I'm definitely going to purchase that, whatever it may be. Right. And, uh, it's like, you need people to take those chances because a lot of times cool, interesting substance, you know, things, whatever word you want to choose, for music, that's going to outlast marketable. You know, I think so. It's just taking that leap, and it's you need some good business savvy people that have a love of the art still. Yeah, to come in and go like, yeah, I wear a suit, but they can talk to you about music and for go sure. like, we're going to take a chance, man. We're going to put you on the road. We're going to do this big push. We might lose a shitload of money, but we believe in you, and we need you to try. You know, man, and yeah, for sure. And because then, and- then if it fails, you know, like it just wasn't meant to be. Right. Or, you know, that wasn't the right fit or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, those stories happen all the time and, you know, um, just take some work to get there. And, um, but it's definitely work that I'm willing to do Mm -hmm. because, uh, I've had some jobs before and it's kind of funny. I had a boss tell me one time, he goes, Matt, I sure hope you make it with that guitar. Because you're not good for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the job? <laughs> it was helping out like this really good contractor. He was like number one Angie's List guy in Nashville. And, uh-huh. Like I was just, you know, helping him put outlets and walls and fixing yeah. cabinets and, you know, door steps and just weird handyman stuff. Uh huh. Um, yeah, that was just. Meanwhile, you're writing songs hilarious. about putting nails through water lines in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I held on to that job a lot longer <laughs> after buying a house. Good Lord. Our house was, uh, it's an old uh, East Dallas home. It was built in, uh, I think it was 52 or 53. So you're mm. built in 1951 song. I'm, I'm listening to that, just loving it. Because uh, our home was owned by the same person, I think, since 1953. And wow. she went into assisted living and sold the house and uh so we when we bought it it was like a time capsule like original cabinets and all but oh, wow. but it was all like builder's grade stuff none of it was very nice it was all mm. very cheap yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. the time period and so we bought the house knowing like it's going to need everything and that's yeah. fine we got a deal on it because of that and um when we started tearing it apart to to fix it 
we realized like she was probably at an income level where she couldn't hire very good people to fix stuff. She had to hire like the handyman who didn't really know what they were doing mm-hmm. or, or the guy who could just get it done for cheaper. And, um, so we ran it like, we weren't going to take the kitchen cabinets out originally. We were just going to leave them for a few years until we could save up some money. But we were tearing so much of the house apart. We were like, let's just do Might it as well. Yeah. Cause we had to rewire the electric. It didn't have a, uh, ground. it didn't have a ground mm-hmm. and we we're like, we got to update this. We're planning on having a kid in here and we yeah. need to. So when we did pull the cabinets out, we saw that the, uh, the pipe that drained the kitchen sink and the dishwasher had a giant, like maybe four or five inch oval hole in the bottom of the pipe. And so anytime you ran it, it just poured into the wall and we were like, Oh, Okay, but it, and then there's all that mold. Well, there was no mold, thankfully. I don't know Good how we dodged Lord. that. Um, but we were looking and we were like, Where's "What is this?" Going? Then we saw like a maybe a three inch hole that was drilled in the floor <laughs> just in front of the wall under the cabinets. So you couldn't see it until you pulled the cabinets out, or if you had gotten in the cabinets and looked in there. So the handyman she hired just drilled a hole so that the water would drain under the house so that it wouldn't flood her kitchen. I guess. And so I don't know if she knew that or not, but um, either way, it looked like probably all she could afford. And that's when we realized like, oh, that's why the foundation over here, it's a pier and beam home, you know, you can get under there. I was like, oh, so that's why this side of the house sunk is she was letting water drain under here every day for probably five or 10 years, you know. And um, the kitchen floor in that area is still just slightly bowed from all the moisture under the house, I guess, and shifting and stuff. And you're when you start tearing apart those old houses, you see everyone's like, poor handyman that they hired the work that was you're like okay they did this here they did that there they screwed this up (laughs) yeah yeah there's a there's an area of the house that we bought that the hallway roof is lower than all the other roofs Mm -hmm. or ceiling Mm -hmm. and um we i poked my head in the attic one day and the original (laughs) roof had just caved in right there <laughs> or the the, the, ceiling. the ceiling yeah and they just like just built another s- just right below it right below it <laughs> yeah man but in their world that made perfect sense they're like oh we can just run a couple boards <laughs> instead of tearing all this down and then putting in new like we're just gonna leave that and then just like build right yeah. underneath it yeah it's it's yeah um god Home ownership, dude. Man. It's great. It's always something, right? I love that song because it's only a song you understand if you've bought an old house. Man, you know, or I don't know what you know. People buying new homes, maybe they deal with it too, but it really is. I'm it's sure, like, I'm sure, but probably not near as much as an old one. But, yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it uh, it made for a very relatable song. <laughs> yeah, well, and like the house, um, like when we were pulling, like when we were moving some stuff around uh in terms of like the layout you know um i tried to do as much as this if it didn't need a permit i would do it myself right if it needed a permit i would hire the person who could do it correctly and um so there were times where i'm like hammering two by fours into the the existing walls and then you realize like when they talk about old homes being built better and it's like and you look at the grain pattern and that two by four and it's so much more condensed and there's so many more lines than like a newer two by four mm. because it was an old tree that they cut down versus a, a younger tree that we use now for mm. um, for building. And it's like I felt like such I felt like I was really shitty at doing all of it because I'd go to hammer a nail and the wood was so hard it just bends the nail. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like <laughs> And I'm like, I'm not meant for this work. <laughs> like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it the best I can here, but you know, clearly this needs like a skilled laborer, not <laughs> just a guy who's willing to do it. Or yeah, YouTube uh, tutorial on it. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, and I think about guys like I, your dad. Sounds like he was probably very similar to uh, to my dad, but like that generation that just knew how to do shit before there was YouTube. It's like, how do you know how to work on this? My dad always called somebody. Oh, it's really? Kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, he he never wanted to do anything. Um, nice. And you know that would have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just figure out as you go, I guess. But man, yeah, buying a house, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah, especially an old one. And like, I don't even think you realize it, but there's going to be some time capsule stuff in your song that uh like a lot of those old country songs they sound old right but at the time they recorded it that was all modern stuff they were talking about mm-hmm. and so 
stuff like you're talking about, like just having like a 30 year mortgage and those types of things, those are going to seem like old fashioned things when you're an old man, because the way you buy and own a home is probably going to be very different. You know, that's interesting to think about. Well, because I mean, think about like your parents when they bought their first home, very different than your experience, man. It uh, was probably, you know, so the house that we bought, um, we, um, I had, my car broke down one day and I had an old guitar teacher buddy of mine that we, um, we started playing music together again recently. And, uh, he came and picked me up. He got out of his car and, uh, she was like, man, this is so weird. I lived in this house in the seventies. <laughs> he had lived in my house and his roommate was a really amazing Fort Worth musician. And, uh, he told me what that guy paid for it, and I just wanted to scream. <laughs> in the seventies, how much that thing? Yeah, he bought it for, and then knowing what we bought it for, I'm just like, what? Mm-hmm. So that makes me want to hang on to the dang thing. Well, and you just got to think, man. You know, unless the country just collapses, like as long as we keep going, um, someone's going to look back on what you paid for it and is going to be like, God, I can't believe you got a house that cheap. Exactly. And we're going to be like, I don't know how you guys are affording these homes now, you know? Oh, my um, God. Because our home's the same way. Like, we think, you know, like, oh, we probably overpaid, you know? Well, in we, Texas, you know, too, everything's just appreciating like crazy Ridiculous. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. I look yeah. at the people buying homes next to me, and I'm like, I wouldn't pay that much to be my neighbor. <laughs> uh-uh. No, man. Yeah. But, uh Anyway, let's let's round this thing off, man. I appreciate you making the drive out here. Uh, like I said, it's a phenomenal record, and I hope that as you continue with it, you know, you at least realize uh, to a listener like me, it feels like, you know, a very complete. You couldn't have made it any other way. Record. Um, so I hope you're as proud of it as you you appear to be, at least. Anyway, thank you. And you're so not much, like Travis. killing yourself inside about how uh, you would have changed uh, it. Okay, good. No, not at <laughs> all, man. I'm so proud of this thing, and thank you for taking notice and having me on. Yeah, here today. absolutely. And uh, where's the uh, where's the best pay- place for people to follow you? Is it Instagram? Is that your preferred? Instagram. I'm pretty active. Facebook. Uh, I try to stay pretty active. Um, Is yeah, it all just Matt Tedder? Those are the two. Yeah, Matt Tedder. Um, pretty easy to find and then music's on Spotify, iTunes, and then you can buy it on vinyl and CD through my website, mm-hmm. um, dot com. And, uh, yeah, as you know, maybe I just opened a threads account and yeah, I don't know if go. I'm going to use it, but <laughs> God, you just kind of got to try to stay current in these times yeah. and pick up on whatever's going at the time. But you know, I kind of feel like an old man at heart, so I might just stick around with my Instagram and my Facebook. That seems right. I was telling my wife, I was like, I go, I can't tell if he's 25 or 45. I was like, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Dude, I totally feel 45, if not like 85 sometimes. Not because like, of the looks, because the maturity no. of the music. Well, I was like, <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, I mean, my, my wife will laugh sometime, you know. She'll walk in and I'm watching a World War II documentary, you know. It's like, oh my God. God, <laughs> you're such an old man. You know. Have you hung out with um uh another Fort Worth guy, Garrett Owen, very much? Oh yeah, yeah man. Yeah, I, that's a great I, guy. I played on his record. Uh, oh, you the, did. I think the last record he put out, Quiet Lives. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a phenomenal record. Yeah, man. and you know, I've known Garrett since um I think like 2015 or 16. Okay, and, cool. yeah, man. He's. I'm just, glad you guys know each he's other. He's incredible. Then, and, a lot of similarities you know, in terms of like what you were just saying. Like I, when I was talking to him on here, he's. You know, he's like, I could just go to a cabin by myself for a while. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Cab- uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Garrett's a very interesting dude. I, I love him. Uh-huh. He's a very good friend. Yeah. I'm excited to see uh, what he does, but he's, I don't know. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. <laughs> he sure is. He sure is. And we're going to love him for it. Uh, again, thanks for coming on. If it's okay with you, yeah. I would like to close this episode with you just saying who the record is dedicated to. I would like you to just say your dad's name of and then course. we'll close it off. The, yes. So the record uh, that's out now that you can listen to, uh, you dedicated to your father, who is Charles Tedder. The I'm a fan of podcast, music, comedy, and more.